Hey everybody, this is Chuck here for DeucesCrack.com. Welcome to another episode of Beginning Omaha 8. This week we're going to take a little bit of a look at 6MAX preflop strategy with particular focus on our open raising range from each street. Uh, in this video, we're going to talk a little bit about why we want to be raising preflop in Omaha 8 or better. Discuss our 6MAX opening ranges. We're actually going to focus on the main two spots um, for opening, which would be under the gun and the button, and then kind of shift to mid position and cut off from there. Um, we'll delve into that more later. And of course, tie that all into some post flop theory so we can get a better idea of why we're playing the type of hands we are, just to get a firmer grasp on, uh, you know, 08 fundamentals and set ourselves up better for post flop play and post flop study and practice in the future. So first off, uh, let's talk a little bit about raising in Omaha eight or better. Now, last week we covered early position preflop play. And when you're talking about early position, I, I do think there is a pretty decent chunk of hands that one could argue you may want to play for a limp, uh, simply because they're too good to fold in a very good game. Uh, you can liken them to maybe small pocket pairs in, in a good live no limit hold'em game. Like you don't want to play it for a raise, uh, but you still want to play the hand. Now, I think those situations are much fewer and far between in 08 than most people would have you believe. Um, those of you who watch any of my recent videos or any of my ghost videos ever do see a good amount of open limping from a lot of villains. And, you know, to some degree, that means there is a, a perception out there or a belief that open limping certain hands in certain spots can be correct. But uh, raising in 08, it, to me, is ever since I started playing 6 max 08, I've always been the one raising at the table and it has done wonders for my win rate and it really makes the game much more profitable. Uh, first and foremost, your opponents can make more mistakes. Uh, one unique thing about a limit game is that the, the size of your mistakes actually can decrease over time uh, in other, uh, uh, throughout a hand. right? In no limit hold'em or even in a pot limit game, I could face you with two to one odds in the river every time. But you can't do that in a limit game. So to some degree, the mistakes become less uh, frequent. Now, when it's already a mistake to be defending a hand preflop, that's another mistake our opponent makes. And usually when someone makes a, a, a preflop mistake, it's compounding. Uh, it's a mistake then to play that hand on the flop, turn, and river. So you're just adding more and more mistakes to the opponent. Now, the counter to this, of course, is, well, we can just limp and play the pot and they'll still make the same post-flop mistakes. Well, you're going to win less that way. And also it's going to be tougher for us to play because our actions, our bets to try to take down a pot, maybe with a barrel, are going to be at a worse price. So it just makes a less profitable environment for us. Another huge advantage to raising in Omaha 8 or better, and this is something you'll get better at with experience, but I always say, and, and this is much more evident in four card games, because people are much more transparent uh, just because of the lack of flexibility. Uh, in other words, the nuts are the nuts, and people are always fearing the nuts in an Omaha variant. So there's a little bit less malleability, a little bit less aggression. Uh, now, what that means is a lot of players are going to play their best hands in a very face-up way. Now, that'll let us get away from some of our weaker holdings, which is the way I used to approach those situations. Like, oh, that's a raise. I can now lay down something that I know is dominated. But what about when I have a middle to your hand and I see one of those players limp? Now we should be excited because we're actually playing against the weaker part of their range. So we can push pots and build more equity because in those limp situations, you have less fold equity. We can put more, we can force people to put more money in behind, you know, in later position, we're going to find ourselves doing that with a wider range, but even out of position and we'll focus on the blinds in next week's video, uh, we will be able to build pots when our hand is so good position isn't nearly as important. And finally, image is a very real consideration in any game. Uh, you want to be the player pushing people uh, to make decisions over and over again. Um, you know, people stubbornly calling down is one of the biggest leaks possible in Omaha 8 or better. Just never letting go of middle two pair. Uh, you will never, I mean, to say never is obviously false, but it'll be very difficult to profit. And the type of people that people don't fold against are the people always raising. I don't love this last bullet point here. I don't think it's that important, but um, it's it's something worth noting and it's it's something helpful and another upside to raising. 
So let's talk a little bit about our six max opening ranges. Um, as I mentioned, we're going to focus mainly on under the gun and the button. Uh, you know, the unique thing about four card games is there's so many different commutations and permutations, over 270,000. Uh, it's a lot easier, it's a lot di more difficult to break down the four cards. So what I find is best, especially in a six max situation, is you can have a very firm understanding of what you should be raising on the button and why, what you should be raising under the gun and why, and then make your cutoff range a function of the button and your mid position range a function of under the gun. And essentially you've saved yourself a lot of memorization and kind of practice. Uh, um, and more importantly, uh, we will be able to adapt more on future streets, um, future layouts of the table, so to speak, right? One thing I talked about in the earlier episode was how full ring games are fun and 08 because next thing you know, you're shorthanded three minutes later. Uh, players getting up and walking or players jumping in to try the game, realizing it's 08, I mean, and not, and not PLO, this is maybe specific to online versus live, but all of those things really, I think it's one of the better games to keep yourself on your toes. So this is, I think this approach is going to be much more sound and much more profitable for everyone in the long run. So one thing we are going to have to do though, because I do want to display a lot of information and give you the full wide range of the types of hands I'm playing from all seats is we're going to keep using that shorthand I used in the previous episode, where we go through the types of cards we're raising from each seat. Now, that being said, it's important that when you look at shorthand, you assume that all the cards are working together. Uh, what do I mean by that? I just want to go over a couple of shorthanded opening uh, ranges that uh, I'm going to express with, with this shorthand, and then we'll take a look at what that means and really what it doesn't mean. Starting with a pretty extreme example here, right? Broadway and three wheels. When I say Broadway and three wheels, three wheels, it's it's this one should be pretty clear that I mean a hand like king five four three and not. 10 and trip fives, right? We're not playing any trips hands. But what about some more subtle examples? Like Broadway, Broadway, wheel, wheel. Well, it's very important that we look at, it, at that and we say, okay, king, queen, four, three, right? King, queen, four, five would fit in that and king, king, four, three. But we're not saying king, king, four, four. Those small pairs are not playable. They, I mean, there are situations where I will have a small pair in my hand, of course, but in general, when we're looking to open raise, I'm not looking at those two small cards and thinking this is something helping or working or even remotely good. But you can't say unpaired because pocket kings are actually good, and specifically in a steel situation. I mean, these types of hands, king, king, four, three, are, are great hands to have on the button. But it's important that we acknowledge that when it comes to wheel cards, we're looking for cards to be working together in making a low and straight. Those types of things are what's important to us. Um, and in big cards, we want to have you know classic Texas Hold'em value to them. And there can be some, some subtle nuances as well, right? So Ace Broadway, Wheel, Wheel, which I'm raising those in, in quite a few spots. But there's a pretty big difference between Ace, Queen, 2, 3 and Ace, Queen, 2, 2. And there's another difference between Ace, Queen, 2, 2 when the 2 is suited with the Ace. Right now that second two is maybe kind of helping a little bit, but when I want to be playing ace Broadway wheel wheel from early position, uh, I'm likely to avoid the ace queen two two. That's one of the worst ace Broadway wheel wheels, simply because the two is paired. It's a little bit on the fence. Um, that discretion and these fine lines, uh, number one, if you have any questions about specific hands that maybe uh, fall in between these cracks, definitely post them here in the forums. Uh, I will definitely uh, clue you guys in as to my thoughts on how to play that type of hand from XYZ position. Um, and these types of subtle nuances and little in, as I, you know, the phrase I'll borrow it once more, in between the crack type hands that we have, uh, we'll get much better at as we go on. For now, if you are on the fence and you are new to the game, my advice would probably be to fold. If you think that the hand may be playable, but you're not sure. Um, if it's something more like an ace queen two two, and you're I don't know if I wanna raise them in early position, I, I wouldn't limp, uh, but it's probably better than raising it. If you're gonna be bloating a pot, that's a hand that's tough to play. So now on to our under the gun opening range. I think it's pretty exciting because I haven't seen much six max 08 uh, laid out like this. And quite frankly, when I realized I hadn't done it, I was excited to make it. Um, a lot of the online action is going to be six handed. Uh, it's going to be short handed and not preparing for a short handed game when you're sitting down in a four ring atmosphere, I think again, could really cost you, especially live when 
the game does get shorthanded. A, the game is going to get better. B, you can always talk to the floor about getting reduced rake. So just keeping these ranges in mind for any shorthanded situation is going to be way better. Um, and again, in any atmosphere where people are playing the game less frequently that way, in other words, if everyone's used to full ring and now I get to play three or four handed, it is a huge advantage for the player who's experienced with shorthanded. So first and foremost, uh, we are obviously going to be raising all of the hands we discussed playing from early position. I put a bit of an asterisk here because I want to review it, but it's a good time for yourself uh, to take just to take yourself to review what kind of hands you were playing from there. Spoiler, um, it's we're basically playing the best ace twos and the best uh, I mean, playing all of the very, very good ace twos and the very, very best ace three suiteds. Uh, I say ace three suiteds, but even if I said the very, very best ace threes, that should imply that we're looking at suited hands, double suited hands. If I'm single suited, I want a lot of work going along with it. Um, the very, very best. We want to be super tight. Uh, but that's from before under the gun, right? This is the three seats before. So we're going to be raising all of those, obviously, playing all those hands. We also now want to add some of our worst ace threes, but we still want some premium additions to it, right? I'm not excited about playing an offsuit ace three with little to no help, like ace three, nine, eight, rainbow under the gun against a bunch of unknowns. That type of hand, again, we still have a lot of act players left to act behind us. We, especially in a shorthanded situation where players are going to be playing wider ranges from the blinds, we don't have the type of hand that's going to be able to bet twice nearly as often. We're going to find ourselves wanting to pot control and play a guessing game on the river. Um, so because the hand isn't strong enough. So we want some premium additions to go along with our ace three holdings. We also want to be playing our very best ace Broadway Broadway wheels. I wanted to include this because I, I don't think you should really consider folding like an ace king queen four double suited under the gun because that hand is just so strong on the high end. Um, one thing about the high end of a hand is heads up in position, high hands with a little bit of low help are great. Uh, simply because you likely have half of uh, you have a strong shot at both sides of the pot um, you also just have a very strong high hand that can make some scoops uh, so these hands in particular because of their multi-way play playability on the high end uh, not having the best low isn't nearly as important when we're maybe double suited or something like that because i'm fine betting the second nut low draw plus a nut flush draw that's a lot different than the second nut low draw plus second pair into three players, right? That, uh, that you know, second nut low draw plus second pair into three players really needs to make trips very often to scoop. Uh, any of this that's new to you, again, once we get into post slot play, we will you know cover all this. But uh, the the power of the the high suited strong connectivity, it's it's it means we have more opportunities to scoop. And there are more board textures where our hand can take multi-way action, right? And I wouldn't hate opening King King 2-3 double suited. Um, those of you who watched any of my older videos working with uh, Big Bad Babar, where we played some Omaha 8 or better and Limit Hold at the same time, I called this hand the Babar. He uh, would ask me about it quite a bit. And with good reason. It's a great hand. It's probably the best non-ace hand we have. And the thing about a hand like King King 2 3 double suited is even on ace high board textures, you can continuation bet at a pretty high frequency comfortably. And one thing most players underestimate, I mean, grossly underestimate, is how wide they're getting called. So this hand is actually going to be a value bet more often than you think when you are barreling. So we're betting as a semi bluff, but the strength of our semi bluff is actually a lot, long, a lot, lot stronger than you think. And being able to bet with kings and have some high value uh, with the nut low on some A-side board textures, it's going to result in a lot more scoops than you think. Uh, just the, the ultimate premium pocket kings that don't involve an ace, uh, I think, are, are going to be fine for an open raise in this seat. Now, we've covered, we really see that from under the gun, we haven't added all too much. Uh, it's difficult to get the exact numbers and percentages on hands you'd be raising because... As I showed you, there are going to be some instances when we're going to be removing um, some of those uh, holdings from there. You know, like Ace Broadway Broadway Wheel. If I put that in the Pro Poker tools, which can enumerate us for us, uh, it, it's it's going to kind of you know, we have to kind of 
finagle in there, but it's, it's about 10% of hands in that, in that range, it's a little bit tighter than we would in no limit hold'em. But I want to talk about what happens as we move to the button and, and, and on multiple levels. So first off, uh, number one, we see we're adding a lot more ace wheel star star combinations, and that's what we're going to continue to do, right? We, we started with our good ace twos and ace threes. You, you understand we're going to add some ace fours and ace fives and open up that other card that goes along with our ace. We also want to add more premium low holdings to our hand. We're more excited about adding, you know, some king wheel, 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 double suited type hand to our open range than we necessarily are about, you know, uh, high only type hands that are playable from a lot of seats, maybe for balance purposes and, and really just because, uh, you know, they, they can, they're a little bit deceptive and, and have a lot of uh, value to them. Uh, why are we doing this? Well, the first, the first and most obvious reason is these are the best hands in Omaha 8 or better. This is what makes a good hand in Omaha 8 or better, right? We talked about what makes a good playable multi-way hand in 08. Uh, but why is that? What gives these hands their preflop power? And when I say adapting at the table and to different situations, uh, in this episode, I'm, I'm strictly speaking in the context of number of players at the table. And the number of players at the table is what we're using to dictate how loosely we're open raising. Now, we may find ourselves in some full ring situations where we have incredibly loose players behind us. So loose so that we don't want to fold any suited ace two from under the gun. Uh, and, and we can make those decisions and change our ranges at the table as a function of the other players, as well as the number of seats, if we understand where these hands are getting their preflop power from. So, so what makes these playable and what makes them good in 08? First, one thing you're going to find as we start shifting to post-slot play is that high card flops equal fold equity. And when I say fold equity, I mean mostly immediate fold equity. Anyone with a good amount of limit experience knows that it's not too often where your continuation bet is not called once, right? This was a big adjustment for me as I started to be able to see some more of my opponent's showdowns on some of the other American networks and things like that, where I was able to take a look at what people were actually calling me with once or twice. Um, and the more heads up I play, the more it comes up too, where you see you're getting peeled on uh, any real low draw board with any pair, any over cards, trying to make top pair, trying to make a best high. And if they have a backdoor low, it's, it's a call. Um, because a lot of players are over defending, and like as we talked before with the preflop mistake of calling too much, a lot of those preflop mistakes involve what? What would be the worst hands? Hands that include sixes, sevens, eights, and nines. And uh, those, those hands do not do well on high cards. So we can say that it's more sixes and sevens and eights. By the way, I think nines, it's semi-understood that they're bad cards. But defending hands like eight, seven, seven, four, uh, which I've been picking on. I don't know why in my mind lately, but those are just really bad hands that don't have any place to play. And one thing about a lot of those hands is they just immediately fold those flops. So in other words, I'm a lot more comfortable. The, the way to, to kind of sum this up is I'm a lot more comfortable continuation betting two, three, four, five on a king, queen, jack than I am continuation betting king, queen, jack 10 on a two, three, four. Simply because I don't want to barrel a king, queen, jack, uh, I mean, I don't want to barrel either of those boards with either of those hands, but I also don't think I'm going to even get to bet twice. Um, I'm, I'm sorry, I, I don't think I'm going to have to bet twice that often on that king-queen jack board. So it, it makes sense that I want to have some low in my hand. Another hugely profitable situation in Omaha 8 or better is when you have a lock on the nut low plus a draw to the high. So this is where you can really, really punish players. I mean, really, really punish players um, when you can, A, remove combos of ace two from their range. Now, that does not sound that easy to do, but if I'm playing against a loose aggressive player or a normal aggressive player and they have limped and I am certain that they're, and as certain as you can be at a poker table, of course, uh, that their range does not include ace twos. And if it does, it's incredibly discounted. When I have a hand like ace two with ace two jack ten with spades, on a seven eight three with two spades, uh, I'm pretty happy to put a lot of money in because 
I know that this player can never have a low, et cetera. Uh, that's a pretty extreme example. We'll cover some better ones. Um, you know, you want more maybe an uncounterfeitable low, but this kind of free roll opportunity and, uh, you know, aggressiveness in pushing for equity, for I mean, aggressiveness in, in pushing your equity in combination with hand reading is one of the more profitable spots in like, and it's really like the big session uh, thing. You know, when you're really crushing it, these are the moments that, that come up pretty often. And finally, uh, this kind of tied into that first point when I talked about the high card flop uh, generating more fold equity is that low hands can barrel more. And this, to me, uh, you know, in the states of the games today, I, I think you want to have a lot of hands that you can bet twice with because you want to be able to push your opponent off things. Uh, you just want to be able to bet twice. It makes sense if people are peeling the flop way, way too much. Um, if we want to be playing pots in position and we want to have hands that can pick up equity on the turn, um, barreling more to me essentially means our semi bluffs have a little bit more credibility, right? That lack of malleability I talked about in a four card game that, uh, you know, the firm nature of the fact that we need to use two of our cards really does create some more unique post-op situations. So having connected, suited hands with lows to them is really important. Now, before we dive into the button range, I just want to cover one more uh, shorthand that I'm going to use. Uh, this is, you know, you can go on propokertools.com or you can download the software, but this is where uh, I learned all this notation and this is the notation I use to describe uh, all of my, my ranges, and a star just means everything. The one important thing, again, is we still need to use discretion, right? If that star is really ruining the hand, if it's just a garbage hand, this isn't like a, uh, a contract where we're trying to read between the lines. This is just a, a nice, easy way of uh, displaying clean information. Again, though, any of these that are confusing, please refer to post. I'm happy to clarify at any point. Now, let's talk about our button stealing range. Uh, it is an incredibly profitable spot. Heads up in three-handed Omaha eight or better is a very good game. Uh, and we want to be playing very aggressively on the button. We're not talking about a heads up range here. Of course, this is specifically my six max button opening range, um, opening north of th about 30 to 35% of hands, probably a little bit more, the more you get used to, uh, playing. And more importantly, this is the one spot where my range is really going to fluctuate just like it should in any game, right? If you are completely new to poker, um, or if you are seasoned, uh, I'll just explain it, but, uh, you know, having tight players in the blinds means we have more fold equity. So we want to be attacking more having loose, aggressive players in the blinds that we know we're going to defend. We want to have a bit of a stronger range. Uh, and we, we know we'll be given the opportunity to uh, play a big pot in position. So again, these ranges that I'm discussing here are all my defaults. The more we get into post slot play, the more we'll look at situations where we're going to open them up or tighten them up. But for now, what would I be comfortably be opening my first button at the table? Now, let, let's talk about all the different ace -X type of hands I'm willing to raise. All of my pocket aces, even my very worst ones, I'm just going to go ahead and raise. You do block two of the aces, which is very relevant for post-slot play because your opponent won't be able to blindly bet with a decent low out of position on a later street. So they kind of have to play a little bit more face up. Um, also, the hand, these hands just have power, right? Just good to have pocket pairs. Any of my ace wheels, even including like my ace two twos and my ace three threes, the very, very worst ace wheels, like ace trips, I'm not raising, but ace 224, uh, ace 448, even, um, I'm probably raising stuff as bad as that. Um, having that low in position is incredibly powerful. Again, low means barrel. If you think about it, any 2-3x board, we can bet that ace 44 on, which is pretty awesome. And when our opponent doesn't three bet or just calls out of the big blind and they're playing as loose and passive as they are, I'm pretty comfortable betting that ace four on any combination when we have the low, because I do believe my low is best. And, you know, it, what's nice about that is those mistakes I discussed earlier when players are calling down with their weak two pairs, sometimes they feel like they're correct because they happen to get half the pot back. But, you know, a game where you guess if you have the best hand and then are given your money back if you get it right. If I can open a casino with that game, 
wow, <laughs> we'd be in pretty good shape, right? Uh, now I included a six star star here. When, we're, when we move over to a six star star, we're going to be talking a little bit more about the, the better a six, six, uh, a six star star. Um, I'm probably going to be dumping my very, very worst ones here. Uh, what would the worst a six star star look like? Hmm. Ace, uh, six, six, nine, right? If I'm paired there with my nine, I think ace nine, nine, six, I'm probably fine raising any ace pocket pair six, uh, two Broadway cards. Hands like ace six, eight, nine, I don't think would be that bad to raise. I understand that those are two bad cards to go that we do have the button and there's some connectivity there. And it, it's the, the big issue with playing a, a worse version of a hand is if you're not able to find a fold with it on later streets. So the more comfortable you are with your how your opponents are playing post slop, and more importantly with your own post slop game, the more excited I'd be to raise one of those hands. For now, if you're completely new, I would suggest sticking to the second tier, like kind of better a six star stars, avoid those middling cards, maybe give yourself a Broadway with it. Um, because a lot of times you you won't be able to bet that naked a six on the flop or turn. So you want a little bit more help with it. And then all of our good ace Broadway, Broadway, Broadways. I understand that I may be doing some duplication here, but I like to stick to all of my ace X. Like this could be included in the all Broadways. Uh, one nice thing is if you count a hand twice, it doesn't count on your percentiles or anything like that. Um, so we've got all of our ace X hands covered here, right? We see the ace seven doesn't really have much value. We're not really excited about playing ace eight. Um, I'm not saying there's no situations where I'd play those like an ace king, queen eight, double suited. I may want to go ahead and raise. So something to keep in mind, of course, you know, ace Broadway, Broadway, Broadway. If we have ace king, queen 10 rainbow, and I'm telling you to raise that, what's better? Ace king, queen 10 rainbow or ace king, jack seven double suited? I mean, I would take the double suited ace king, jack seven. Uh, this seven is not re that relevant for the low, but we can play a hand for high and have some backup low potential. So we want strong coordinated aces when we're opening on the button. Understandable, right? This one's easy. Now, how about our Broadway type openings involving wheel cards, right? We said we want to be adding more wheel cards to our open raising range when we get to late position. What types of hands do we want with it? Well, if we're looking to involve some middling cards in our hand, I want my Broadway card to be highest. So I'm looking for mainly King X if I'm going to be playing some like King 9 suited with wheel cards or even King 9 wheel wheel with the suits. Uh, in other words, king nine two three with nine two of diamonds or something like that. I think is playable for a raise on the button, uh, even like a king eight. That emergency low can't be that terrible. Uh, understand that when you are this star is really when it's not included in the wheel uh, and it's not a six. Maybe it's more part of the high card value. So it's it's for those eight high flops that we can bet and things like that. So we're not so excited to play them, but definitely worth it for a steal. And on that note, we can include just the Broadway, Broadway wheel wheels, right? Queen nine, queen eight, not nearly as powerful as a queen jack or a queen 10. So I'm looking to keep those other two cards higher. Um, and having two wheel cards to go with it will give us that low side of the hand that can give us a little bit of uh, barreling equity. And more importantly, just help us flop the nuts and things like that more often. The wheel cards are really good when you don't have an ace in there, because this way on the ace high flops, again, we need a little bit of equity. We want to be able to bet comfortably and not have not be able to just, like, you know, bet have to bet fold every flop. Um, and star wheel, wheel, wheel. We want to be a little bit selective here, right? Three, four, five, nine rainbow. No, thanks. Three, four, five, nine, double suited. You got it. Um, and even three, four, five, nine rainbow is a little bit close, but I want to be playing that against the tighter players. Uh, and obviously that star, this is, a, you know, a situation where uh, that star kind of dictates itself in terms of uh, how we view hands in Omaha eight or better, right? It's, it's not a wheel card. It's not a Broadway card. It's not an ace. So a six actually, yeah, it's probably our best one. And then seven's okay. I don't want an eight. I'd rather have a king. So you can think of it that way. And I, uh, but I'm, I'm raising these hands for a steal on the button. And finally, um, our premium high hands. And I don't hesitate to raise my premium three card high hands, like a king, queen, jack, six, double suited, things like that. Uh, just coming in for a steal with hands like that on the button should be fine. Um, I understand I'm, I'm talking quite a bit about the suitedness of hands, but it, it does make for a slightly stronger hand. We want to be raising them sometimes. And if you have an option to do something in poker, 
um, you know, if someone said, "You well, you have to go all in with, with one hand, which would you pick? You would always pick the better hand. Um, and another nice thing about that is when we do check back some flush draws on the turn on low only boards, we have some more equity and you can have some fun lines where your opponent bets thinly for value on the river and you raise your flush for value. Um, you know, I, I know these little moments, you know, can't really define a hand, but if you add up all these little things that uh, can be profitable post-flop, you see what makes a hand profitable pre-flop. So we've discussed our under the gun opening range and our button range. As I said, what I want to do now is take our under the gun range and shift it over to middle position and take our button range and shift it over the cutoff. Why am I not just going around in that direction? Honestly, I find that the bigger jump really is from middle position to the cutoff. Uh, there's still two players left to act behind us as opposed to just the one. Um, and, and I mean, it, twice as likely someone is going to have a hand to play. So uh, it's it's something to keep in mind. Um, yeah, and we still want to be relatively tight for mid position. Uh, so I, I, let's let's uh, let's jump in. Let's talk about under the gun to middle position, right? We talked a little bit about what happens as we're moving across the table. Um, though, as I just mentioned, the translation from seat to seat is not necessarily linear. Uh, so what are we really adding when we come from our under the gun range with those good ace threes, uh, best ace Broadway and wheels, we've got all those good ace twos in there. Well, now we're gonna add our good ace fours and our very best ace five. So I wanna suit with that ace five. And I think, um, I want to be particular about the ace fives I'm playing because it is significantly worse than a four or a three. So like a double suitedness to it, uh, good connectivity on the high end. I'm not too, ex I mean, I'm not playing like my ace nine, nine fives and things like that rainbow. No, absolutely not. Uh, but uh, some of our good ace fours, uh, we want some connectivity to them, you know, especially from earlier position, when you're trying to draw these lines between good and best, the things like pairs and connectivity really come into play quite a bit because of the uncertainty behind us. The fact that more players can be calling, it's something to keep in mind. So you want to be selective here. We can now add though, some of our worst ACE three suiteds. Um, in other words, like some of those ACE threes plus middling cards, but we have a good suit to it and things like that are a little more powerful. Now they still have good multi-way playability. We fear the ACE two a little bit less and they're going to be enough for me to want to come in for a raise. You know, on top of that, I'm not really adding all too much. I know we talked about the double suited kings, and and we I spoke specifically of king king two three double suited. I am not probably folding any double suited kings plus wheel combo from this seat either. I do think though it's best, especially when getting started, to stay tight from these earlier positions where you can find yourself out of position a lot. It just is that much more difficult, especially in a four card game, when you don't have as much fold equity post flop uh, to be uh, playing hands. So I like being tight. Now, button to cut off. This is kind of interesting because before we, we were opening up our range and we saw we're adding a little bit and now we're tightening up our range. We're actually taking out a good amount. Um, if I had to just say what my cutoff opening range was, I would really describe it as a premium button range. In other words, uh, the worst hands that I have on the button, when I look at them, I am not playing them from the cutoff. Uh, I know that's a very, very simple way of translating, and we're going to obviously go over the specifics of it, but it's a pretty good way to think about it, right? The same types of hands, really, right? We, we're really just bucketed into good lows and good lows plus Broadway combos. That's really what we're playing. I could have just said that, but obviously we want to go over it for the first time. And now we want to play the best of those. So what do the best of those really look like? When we go through this uh, ace x range really not much of this changes now those worse ace wheel star star type hands uh you know the very very worst the ace four four eight you know ace five five uh you know nine or something like that i'm not going to be playing those the very very worst ones absolutely not and now we see with my ace six i want some more strength to it give me a broadway card like those ace six eight nines and things not even in my wheelhouse at this point um and again, this can all change. A lot of this changes very quickly too. I'd say a big reason why I'm a fan of this approach too is because your cutoff range should be really dynamic because our buttons, um, I mean, it's not uncommon to be in a six max game with like a someone playing 12% of hands, 
just someone only playing our early position range are playing nine and a half to 11 percent of hands and that's it because they only want to play ace twos and ace threes and that's what they believe is correct regardless of the number of players at the table and when that's the case you better believe uh you know when i'm done playing my right foot hurts from having on the gas so hard the whole time uh pardon my bad jokes but so this is where a situation where our range is going to be very dynamic. And that's why I'm happy to draw the line between the cutoff and button, because you could say, well, this player is actually that tight. I'm going full button range here. Or this player is kind of tight. I'm going to sprinkle in you know, some more of my ace wheels and maybe some of my ace sixes that have a suit. I like those. Um, as I say in the end here, we want suits. Our ace, Broadway, Broadway, Broadways. Again, those good high card multi-way playable ones I'm still fine raising. When we start talking now about our Broadway, Broadway, wheel, wheel, I have King Broadway, wheel, wheel. And that was mainly to show you that I'm not too excited about playing King Nines and King Eights and things like that from the cutoff. Uh, that's obviously a part of Broadway, Broadway, wheel, wheel. But those Broadway, Broadway, wheel, wheels, I want some suits. I want some power to them. The very worst ones. So what would the worst ones be? Jack 10 to five with a, with no suit, not, you know, not, not going to bother with it. Um, but a hand like that, I would probably raise on the button early in a match, no, or early in a game, no problem. Uh, um, that's probably just one of the worst worst ones regardless. Um, what other hands might we not consider that we used to? You know, pretty much something along those lines. Like, you know, again, the worst Broadways are going to be combinations of queens and jacks and tens. Uh, hands that get a lot worse here would be like jack, jack, two, five. Um, the more players in the pot, the worse the hand that's going to play. That is a hand that I'm very fan, very big fan of uh, on the button, especially in a heads-up match. Uh, you've already got showdown value with pocket jacks, which goes a long way from players that can't fold any combination of fours, four cards under an eight. Um, and the two five, it's two wheel cards. That's great. But when you start dealing with a cutoff, that's not a hand that you can really bet into people. When you can take the information that their hand is weak and turn that into a value bet, but having to guess as to where someone is is a lot more difficult than it sounds. And just finally, our, you know, we're still raising our best high card hands. This is uh, something I talk about because it's just one of the topics that, you know, uh, people ask randomly, like, how do I play high card only hands in Omaha eight or better? Um, I prefer just to play everything for a raise. And in these seats, I think coming in for a raise with our best high card hands is fine. Um, again, a lot of what makes a hand right to play is how you play it after the flop. So as we dive more and more into post-slot play, we'll see why we don't have a problem playing any of these hands. Well, hopefully this was an educational look at our six max opening ranges from the four magical seats that we're open raising from. We will be touching on blind defense and three betting in, next in, in the next installment. Uh, so fear not, all of our pre-flop uh, strategies will be covered and we'll be ready to move into post-flop play. Any questions, feel free to post them here on the video thread. Um, if you have any questions about hands to play from certain seats, I would happily chime in. Follow me on Twitter at DC Chuck. Any questions, also tweet me on there. Until next week, this is Chuck for DeucesCrack.com, and I'll see you on the forums.